The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Think for a moment about what brings you pleasure. Food? Nature? If you thought of music, you're definitely not alone. Music is an essential part of human life in almost every global culture. But the ability to record sound is a surprisingly recent development. People say that Edison was the first person to do that. Actually, sound was recorded uh, in 1859, which is almost 20 years before Edison did it, by a man called Leon Scott. Um, and he built a recorder, uh, which he called the phonoautograph. Frenchman Leon Scott's revolutionary invention worked by scratching sound waves into a long strip of paper covered with a sooty powder called lamp black. But it had one major drawback. He had no way of playing these things back. Uh, in 1877, Edison invented the reproduction of sound. He used the stylus to really emboss the amplitude and frequency into a strip of tinfoil, which was wrapped around a cylinder. As the cylinder rotated, the needle moved up and down and created deeper or shallower impacts into the foil. Then he was able to spin the foil again and let the needle be driven up and down by these impressions in the foil. The needle was then coupled to a diaphragm, which created compressions and rarefications in the air, which a listener was able to hear. A few years later, Bell and Tainter introduced wax as a better medium, more durable, more robust. Carl Haber may sound like a historian, but he's actually a senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, specializing in experimental particle physics. Haber's personal interest in music and sound and his skills as a physicist converged one day in 2000. I happened to hear a, a radio broadcast on KQED uh, about the Library of Congress and its collection of sound recordings. In many cases, or some cases, they were damaged or delicate or at risk. Haber had a flash of inspiration. He realized he might be able to use his expertise in sensitive optical measurement technology to solve the problem. He set to work, and by 2005, Haber's team had demonstrated a working prototype of their machine at the Library of Congress. It was called IRENE, short for Image, Reconstruct, Erase, Noise, etc. The system was capable of taking microscopic pictures of the grooves in old damaged records and then playing them back clearly without ever touching them. So how is it possible to play a record without touching it? Well, to understand, you should start with a basic grasp of how sound works. Sound is a sensation that we experience through our ears which uh, respond to compressions and rarefications of the atmosphere around us. And the mechanism of hearing transforms the movement of our eardrum into impulses in our brains that we can then, that we've learned to recognize as sound. When an object causes an excitation, say a hammer hits a bell, the vibrations cause regular fluctuations in air pressure, creating peaks of high pressure called compressions, followed by valleys of low pressure called rarefactions. If you could see them, they'd look something like waves in a pool. Amplitude refers to the magnitude, if you like, of these compressions and rarefications, what we normally associate with the loudness of the sound. By the turn of the 20th century, Edison's method of inscribing these peaks and valleys onto the surface of a cylinder had taken the world by storm. For the first time, anyone could capture and play back sound. For anthropologists like Alfred Kroeber, it would mark the beginning of an era. Kroeber was a professor of anthropology and the director of what was then the University of California Museum of Anthropology, now called the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Kroeber's focus became the indigenous tribes of Northern California, and he specialized in the Yurok family of languages. One of his primary research and preservation tools was the wax cylinder recorder. 
you had to take the cylinder, the recording machine, and you had to take a few crates of cylinders. And Kroeber would take the train from San Francisco to, I think, Eureka. And then they would take the stagecoach uh, up a little bit further north. And uh, then they would load the stuff on mules and go overland uh, to Yurok territory. And then they would set up their equipment in the field. During the first two decades of the 20th century, Kroeber and his associates recorded hundreds of three-minute cylinders of Yurok speech, songs, and stories. The collection is an anthropological gem still housed in Berkeley's Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology. And for many people, the crown jewels of the collection are the recordings of Ishi. Ishi was an Indian who had lived entirely outside of um, white communities at the time when he kind of burst onto the scene in 1910. One day he was encountered by some white people up in the Sierra foothills. No one could communicate with him. They called him wild and they brought him back to San Francisco. He had this very, very thorough and complicated knowledge of traditional culture, including traditional physical practices and cultural practices, and also traditional stories. And some of what survives about Ishii is the stories that he told, which were recorded on wax cylinder. The Ishii cylinders have been a source of careful study since his death in 1916. But like so many of the recordings in the Hearst Collection, the Library of Congress, and elsewhere, the cylinders are deteriorating, and not just from overuse. Unfortunately, there's a mold which attacks a fungus, which attacks the wax and actually eats it. And when it does that, it completely destroys the information. So this is a particularly bad case, we can see all this splotchiness. Haber and his team had already shown with Irene that they could restore old grooved records using a two-dimensional optical scanning technique. But flat records are relatively easy because the waves are visible in two dimensions. Wax cylinders would present a whole new challenge. Edison's modulation was actually vertical, up and down. Photography is not a good way to measure depth. Haver's team would need a different technology if they were to scan and restore the cylinders. They settled on a technology called confocal microscopy. What confocal microscopy does is it, is it trades off um, spatial information for depth. Imagine you're flying over the countryside in an airplane and you're essentially sending something down to the ground which then bounces back to you, some sort of a signal and you get information about the spot directly below you, and then the plane or the helicopter moves, and you cover the landscape in this way. It was a technology with potential, but would it work with wax cylinders? This is where Andrew Garrett and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum's collection come in. We picked um, 12 cylinders out of the Hearst collection that, that were interesting for intrinsic and incidental reasons. They included a somewhat of a variety of physical conditions. There were a couple of cylinders of Ishii, and there was one cylinder of uh, Ohlone language from the Bay Area. The priceless cylinders were mounted on a specially designed spindle in Haber's lab. From here, the confocal microscope would take sequential measurements of the depth of the grooves, extracting an image of the sound captured in them. For Garrett, the results were amazing. I've listened carefully to um, some of the snippets that have been analyzed. It's a miracle that, that there's anything, right? So every time I open it up and listen to it, I have to remind myself that this is audio that comes out of a photograph, and that really is just miraculous. It's an incredible accomplishment. But Haber is the first to point out that the technology still has a way to go. This is a, a very much a work in progress, and we're fortunately riding on all the incredible improvements in scanning technology, speed of computers, speed of cameras, data storage. And they'll need that speed. Haber's team has already restored recordings from Ishii to Jack London, and music from Enrico Caruso to early Les Paul. 
But there are more than 9 million groove format recordings in American collections alone. So it's only now becoming clear just how huge an impact his team of hobbyist scientists may have on American cultural history. What this experience has taught me is that scientists are really interesting people. And, you know, you work on particle accelerators or whatever, and you're, you're trained to apply those skills to that. And you're interested in old music, and somehow, just serendipitously, you put those interests together and you come up with this completely new creative thing. I just think it's wonderful. Keep Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org slash quest.